Okay, we're going to go ahead and start because I really appreciate everyone who is here on time. Again, please feel free to introduce yourself on chat as you come into the room so we know who's in the room. It is wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, Thrive would like to officially welcome you to the League of Women Voters of San Mateo County ballot measures, pros and cons. My name is Petra Sultan and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Education for Thrive, the Alliance of Nonprofits for San Mateo County. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Thrive, we are a membership-based organization with a cross-sector alliance of over 200 nonprofits, businesses, government agencies, elected officials, and individuals with a shared commitment to strengthening the nonprofit sector, thereby improving the quality of life in San Mateo. We offer opportunities for cross-sector collaboration, for capacity building for the nonprofit sector, and for policy and advocacy work. For our policy and advocacy work, we focus on specific issue areas that you see in front of you. Children and education, immigrant and workers' rights, arts and culture, basic needs and safety net, environment and sustainability, and civic participation through elections outreach and through census outreach. By working with our nonprofit partners, we empower them to involve their communities directly. We did this by leading the census outreach in the county. By the way, if you haven't filled out your census form, we're back to October 31st as the deadline, so please do. Um, and we're doing now voter education and outreach. So Thrive is a nonpartisan organization and therefore our focus is really on making voting as accessible as possible to everyone with an emphasis on those communities that are traditionally underrepresented. To that end, along with San, San Francisco Peninsula People Power, we've created a voter engagement partners program. It's supported by the County Elections Office and Silicon Valley Community Foundation. We've created a toolkit that we can customize specifically for your organization to do voter outreach. We're hosting a training tomorrow at 9 a.m. if you're interested, it's only a half hour. Um, and we'd be happy to work with you or your organization to help with your voter outreach efforts. Just email us, go to Thrive's webpage, click on the elections button, or reach out to me anytime. So in addition to under helping people understand how to vote, we see our role as making sure that people have access to all of the information they need to educate themselves about the issues. That is why we're hosting the League of Women Voters so that they can present both the pros and cons on the, both the pros and the cons on the ballot initiatives that we face. California is once again putting forth a lot of uh, initiatives, 12 for the whole state, plus one extra for the um, for our three counties, and it, there's a lot to understand. I want to remind everyone that if you're part of a 501c3 organization, you are allowed to take positions on ballot measures, and you are allowed to lobby for those ballot measures. You are not allowed to endorse a candidate. There are rules that go about it with for reporting about what kind of lobbying you can do and how you can do it. And if you go to Alliance for Justice's website, their Boulder Advocacy Program teaches you all about that. We also have a lot of resources and you can always reach out to Thrive. We would be happy to help you. Again, we're so grateful to the leagues of women voters, both North Central, North and Central San Mateo County and the South Central, uh, South San Mateo County for putting this together and giving us all an opportunity to really learn about the ballot measure so we can make informed decisions. Starting now, voting is already open um, and for being just excellent partners for, for Thrive. So we really appreciate it. And now I will turn it over to the league. Thank you.
Hello and welcome. My name is Linda Atkinson and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of South San Mateo County. Today we have joined with our fellow League members of North and Central San Mateo County to bring you an analysis of the 12 propositions on the California state ballot and the Tri-County Transportation Measure RR. First, I would like to say that this pros and cons presentation is a part of our mission to encourage informed and active participation in government and to increase understanding of major public policy issues. In doing these programs, the League is nonpartisan. That is, we do not support or oppose candidates or political parties. We may, however, support a policy that is believed to advance democracy through our education and advocacy efforts. What is the purpose of having ballot measures? The ballot initiative process gives California citizens a way to propose laws and constitutional amendments without the support of the governor or the legislature. Through the initiative process, citizens can either seek to make new laws, modify existing laws, or amend the California state constitution. We also have the power to repeal legislation by a veto referendum. The California state legislature may also place measures on the ballot as legislatively referred constitutional amendments or legislatively referred state statutes. Referred amendments require a two thirds vote of each chamber before it can appear on the ballot. An initiative requires more yes than no votes to pass. On a referendum, more no votes than yes votes are required to repeal a law. Our approach to the analysis of a ballot measure is to describe the current situation or law and then indicate what the proposition will change or do. We then describe the legislative analyst's office summary of the fiscal effect on governmental budgets and taxpayers. Then come the arguments for and against the propositions and who is making them. Finally, we look at the financial contributions that support or oppose its passing. We hope you then have enough information to vote yes or no as you are inclined. Here are some other things to consider when deciding which way to vote on a ballot measure. What does the measure seek to accomplish? Do you agree with those goals? Is the measure seeking changes that are consistent with your ideas of government? Does the measure deal with one issue that can be easily decided by a yes or no vote? Or is it a complex issue that should be thoroughly examined in the legislative uh, arena? Who are the real sponsors and opponents of the measure? Where is the money coming from? What are the fiscal implications? Does it earmark, restrict, or obligate government revenues? Is the measure self-funding? And given the state's budget deficit this year due to COVID-19, is it a wise spend of limited resources? Please be wary of distortion tactics and commercials that rely on image but tell nothing of substance about the measure. Also beware of half-truths. Today, our presenters will discuss two or more thematically related propositions. So stay on your toes. The props are not discussed in numerical order. For example, measure 15 and 19 seek to change Prop 13 of 1978 fame and thus the constitution. Props 20 and 25 are related to the criminal code. We will pause for a live Q&A where indicated on the slide. Our panelists will answer questions from the audience. So be thinking of your question and type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And before we turn to our propositions, we'd like to take the opportunity to remind you to vote. You have many ways of casting your ballot, from returning a mail-in ballot to a USPS mailbox or a county drop box, to voting in person at a convenient vote center. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Bester. My colleagues and I represent the Leagues of Women Voters of San Mateo County. I will be presenting the pros and cons of state ballot measures 15 and 19. Both are constitutional amendments relating to property tax. First, let's turn to Proposition 15. Proposition 15 is a constitutional amendment put on the ballot by voter initiative. Proposition 15, 
requires commercial and industrial real property to be taxed based on current market value instead of purchase price. It is expected to increase funding for public schools and community colleges, as well as local governments in California. How did this start? In the mid 1970s, property values increased rapidly each year. Taxation of each property was based on its current market value. Each local government entity, the city, the school district, the fire district, levied its own percentage tax on this value. In that period of rapid inflation, individual property tax bills increased quickly. Owners, especially retired homeowners on fixed incomes, were looking for a way to protect themselves against escalating unaffordable property taxes. Proposition 13 was passed in 1978. It limited the taxation value of properties to their acquisition value plus an annual inflation factor no greater than 2% a year. Since property values have increased faster than 2% a year for most of the past 40 years, long-term property holders pay significantly less than recent buyers for equivalent properties. Property tax is also levied on business equipment and fixtures. Statewide, about 65 billion is collected in property tax. Of that, about one-fifth is collected on 600,000 commercial and industrial properties. Statewide, 60% of all property tax paid goes to cities, special districts, county governments, and redevelopment debt. Educational entities receive about 40%. Here in San Mateo County, less is allocated to local governments and more to educational entities. Currently, about 800 million is spent statewide administering property tax assessment and collection. Let me first point out that Proposition 15 does not affect residential property. It would separate commercial and industrial properties from all other properties. It would change their taxation basis and assessment regulations. Single family residences and apartments would not be affected, nor would small commercial property owners or agricultural land. Starting in January 2022, commercial and industrial properties would be taxed on their current market value with reassessment to market at least every three years for properties worth over $3 million. Reassessment of certain small business occupied properties would be delayed until 2025. All businesses in California would also get a new tax break. They would be able to exempt up to 500,000 of equipment and fixtures from the separate 1% business personal property tax. Certain small businesses could exempt more. How will the money that's generated be distributed? A new statewide educational fund would be created. Any new revenue allocated to an educational entity would go into the new statewide educational fund. Note that every county is different. Some allocate more to education, others less. In San Mateo, after all redevelopment obligations have been met, over 62% of new revenues will be allocated to the new statewide fund. Statewide, this contribution is estimated closer to 40%. Then, Money coming out of the statewide educational fund would be allocated primarily based on headcount. However, schools whose local property tax exceeds the state's funding formula will receive less, though a minimum of $100 per student. Many districts in San Mateo County have recently become property tax funded districts due to property tax growth. Those that just qualify to be property tax funded will receive more than $100 per student. Right now, for example, that would include Cabrillo, Redwood City Elementary, and Jefferson High. Overall, due to high levels of property tax, San Mateo County's educational institutions will receive somewhat less than other counties. The remaining new revenue within each county would be distributed to local government entities based on their existing allocations. On average, this is 60% statewide, though it varies greatly. At full implementation in 2025, the Legislative Analyst Office estimates eight to 12 and a half billion of new revenue with several hundred million a year of new administrative costs. Altogether, they forecast between six and a half and 11 and a half billion of net new revenue from this measure. 60% statewide should go to local city, county, and service governments. The 40% allocation to education would represent roughly a four to 7% supplement to the basic funding formula for state funded schools. $100 would represent roughly a 1.2% supplement for our property tax funded schools. Property tax funded schools will receive new revenue, though they may see an offsetting loss of existing business personal property tax. 
The Legislative Analyst's Office also emphasizes that the value of commercial property can change a lot from year to year. So this revenue could also change a lot from year to year. Not all entities would be guaranteed new money. The Legislative Analyst's Office indicates the rural areas may actually end up losing money. Supporters say that Proposition 15 provides billions in new revenue for our communities and schools. They say that 10% of the wealthiest businesses will provide more than 90% of the revenue. They say that it gives tax breaks to small businesses to help our economy grow. And they say that it keeps Proposition 13's protection for homeowners, renters, and farms. Opponents say that Proposition 15 would trigger the largest property tax increase in California's history. They say that additional costs will ultimately raise prices for consumers. They say it will make it harder for people to start small businesses. And they say it will require huge costs to administer. This is a controversial measure that changes the state constitution. We've attempted to capture both sides' arguments. We hope the numbers and information we've presented here provide some local perspective. Supplement this information with other trusted sources. Proponents listed here have raised over 36 million in support of this proposition. Opponents also listed here have raised over 21 million in opposition. Proposition 15, yes or no. A yes vote supports a different market value-based property valuation system for commercial properties. Centralized statewide distribution of the school and community college share of new revenue. A significant change in county assessor and appeals workload. A no vote opposes the proposition's removal of Proposition 13 protections for commercial and industrial properties. Proposition 19 is a constitutional amendment that was put on the ballot by the legislature. It stands in place of an initiative that had been qualified earlier by voter signatures by the California Realtors Association. The legislative version received support from most Democrats as well as some Republicans in both houses. Proposition 19 addresses the ability for qualified homeowners to transfer a low property tax valuation to a new primary residence. It also addresses the right of children to inherit a low property tax valuation on a parent's primary residence, as well as on income properties, including farms. California's existing property tax assessment system is based on a property owner's original acquisition cost plus a limited 2% increase per year of ownership. Properties held for a long period typically pay significantly lower property taxes than similar neighboring, more recently acquired properties. Proposition 60 in 1986 and Proposition 90 in 1998 created the existing law that allows certain homeowners to take one time their existing lower property tax basis with them when they move to a new home. Specifically, homeowners who are 55 or older, disabled, or who have been affected by natural disasters like earthquakes or wildfires can transfer their existing low valuation to a new primary residence that is of equal or lesser market value than their old home. However, statewide, they can only do it within their existing home county or to 10 other counties that allow incoming transfers, including San Mateo, Los Angeles, Orange, Santa Clara, Alameda, and San Diego counties. Meanwhile, Proposition 58 in 1986 created existing law that allows parents to transfer their current low property tax basis to children when the parents transfer a principal residence. This also applies to other real property, both residential and commercial, with a combined current assessment value, not market value, assessment value, of less than 1 million. In 2017, the Legislative Analyst's Office estimated that about 5% of all property transfers in the state, primarily single family homes, had received this exclusion over the past decade. Proposition 19 extends the ability to keep a lower existing property tax basis when a qualified homeowner moves. Instead of requiring the new home's value to be less than the existing home, it can be more expensive. The property tax basis increases proportionally, though only on the excess market value between the two homes. The proposition extends the ability to move to any county in the state for all qualified homeowners. And for those homeowners 55 and over or disabled, instead of just one such transfer, three are allowed. At the same time, Proposition 19 narrows the ability of parents to transfer a low property tax basis to children, except in the case of a primary residence. 
only for a parent's primary residence can the existing property tax basis be transferred to a child. That child must make it their own primary residence within one year, qualifying for a homeowner's exemption. And only the first million dollars of difference between tax valuation and market value is excluded. Proposition 19 also adds family farms to the properties eligible for family transfer or inheritance with their existing property tax valuation. Finally, Proposition 19 provides for any net savings to the state as a result of these changes to flow to a statewide fire response fund. This proposition creates a number of changes in property tax revenue. Generally, these changes counterbalance financially. Over time, the Legislative Analyst's Office expects up to hundreds of millions of dollars a year of increased property tax revenue to flow to local city and county governments. Any decrease in property tax receipts as a result of greater portability for qualified homeowners will be offset by higher property tax payments, particularly those on inherited properties. The Legislative Analyst's Office also expects higher property taxes for schools and community colleges in areas such as ours where many districts are funded by property tax rather than state aid. Finally, the Legislative Analyst's Office expects that the additional property tax generated in state aid funded school districts will lower the state's funding requirements in some years. Any reduction will flow into a fund to improve fire protection and response by both state and local fire agencies. Supporters of Proposition 19 say that the proposition provides housing flexibility for seniors, the disabled, and disaster victims, that it creates homeownership opportunities for new homeowners statewide, that it eliminates unfair tax advantages for heirs of property owners, that it increases funding for firefighters, for schools, and for emergency response. Opponents say that the proposition is a massive tax increase, that it increases competition for smaller, or starter homes, that it takes away inheritance rights of children that have been provided by Proposition 58. The California Association of Realtors provided much of the $35 million of funding in support of the proposition, including qualification of the initiative. The Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association has raised $450,000 in opposition to date. A yes vote on Proposition 19 supports a constitutional amendment that would allow eligible homeowners to transfer lower tax valuations anywhere within the state, unrestricted by home value, up to three times. It would require that inherited homes that are not used as principal residences, such as second homes or rentals, be reassessed at market value when transferred. Also, it would allocate any net state savings that result from the ballot measure to fire prevention agencies. A no vote would maintain existing property tax related advantages and restrictions. Welcome to our live Q&A answer time. Uh, in a moment, we will answer your questions about propositions 15 and 19. Please start uh, typing your questions about Prop 15 and 19 into the chat box at the bottom of the screen. I know the instruction said Q&A, but this is set up a little differently, so we'll take the questions from the chat box. Thank you. Our panelists today are Carol Jensen and Pam Schwartz. Hi there, guys. I'm your moderator, Linda Atkinson. Due to the length of the program, we'll spend about three to five minutes answering questions in each segment. I want to draw your attention to the financial support slides that are in the slide decks. We updated those slides with the most recent financial information. And because of the pre-recording of this session, they don't necessarily match what the speaker is saying about them, but they are the most recent as of September 24th. Finally, I want to thank the excellent production and technical staff of MidPen Media who made this Zoom video presentation possible. So let's go to our questions on Prop 15 first. There are a couple of questions about rental uh, properties. The, uh, if Prop, teen, Prop 15 is passed, it will not affect rental properties, whether it be big apartment buildings, 
or homes that uh, people um, rent out. And if there are uh, rental uh, segments of a building where there's mixed function, those will not be included in the new assessments. I hope that answers your question. Um, small businesses um, are exempted if they are worth, if their property is worth less than $3 million. And that would be with the new assessment. Um, so if a, uh, a grocery store, a small grocery store uh, owns the land and the property, but it is worth less than $2 million um, in uh, fair market value, they would not be, or less than $3 million, they would not be assessed in the new way. They would be excluded. Uh, this also gives a discount to property, uh, business property, um, things like um, equipment and such in that small business owners will get a $500,000 um, tax, property tax exclusion. Um, let's see, any other questions in the chat room? I don't see any but I may have closed down the chat room accidentally. Um, <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. So we have a, um, another question, uh, which is kind of interesting. If both propositions 15 and 19 pass, will there be any conflicts? Carol, do you have an opinion on that one? Oh boy, I was hoping you were going to answer that one. <laughs> so I'm not really too sure because I do know uh, a fair amount about Proposition 19, but not so much about Prop 15. So based on what we just saw um, in the presentation, I'm thinking that they are pretty separate. But what do you think? I think I think they're separate, and I don't think there's any conflict. Um, Prop 15 uh, may uh, put less money into some counties, uh, but Prop 19 might put more money into some counties. It's really hard to assess yeah. the eventual uh, fiscal impact of those things. So um, someone asks, uh, will Prop 15 eventually enroach on Prop 13? Is there any indication of this? Prop 15, let's be clear, does not raise taxes. It changes the assessment. So basically you're gonna be paying more money if your assessment changes, but you're not seeing an increase in tax rate that remains at the 1% of the uh, fair market value. Um, would nonprofit property be reassessed? No, it wouldn't. It's always excluded anyway from property tax assessments. So it would not um, be impacted by Prop 19. Um, does the 3 million limit get adjusted annually by a factor like inflation? Um, it's really, the inflation comes in the increased valuation of the properties and that's what's assessed. And so it's a it's a three million limit. There there is I think an a, an inflation adjustment that goes from every three years or so uh, on up. Um, Carol, let's ask something about nineteen. Um, do some school districts lose money if a house is appraised at a much lower tax base than the one percent sales price? Okay. Well, the answer to that question is yes. Some local uh, governments, cities and counties and so forth, and school districts, importantly, they could lose money if the house is appraised lower. Um, Prop 19 gives the state the ability, however, to backfill the counties that are losing money, and then the counties could therefore distribute that money to the school districts. This is interesting because we've seen this before. A couple of years ago, there was a ballot put on the measure also by the Association of Realtors and it, it's very similar to this, to Prop 19. Um, and what it did not do was provide the backfill portion. So voters then took note of that 
Um, it was also opposed by organized labor and all kinds of local government groups, and it failed by a whopping 20 points. So Prop 19 has been restructured a little bit. Um, the, real, the realtor organization that originally put this on the ballot paid attention to what worked and what didn't work in terms of what the voters were saying. They tried to sweeten the deal quite a bit. They made a lot of changes, and this is Prop 19 that we have in front of us right now. Thank you, Carol. Uh, there's one more question on Prop 15 that we'll take, and uh, and then after uh, I answer that, uh, we'll <laughs> go on to the uh, next propositions. Um, and that is, uh, do small uh, social clubs or golf clubs or entities like that who own their buildings um, end up being uh, hit by Prop 15 if it passes? I think that those would not be considered commercial uh, or industrial properties. And in, if some of them are uh, 501c4s, then they are a not-for-profit. So um, I think that's it. Let's go on to the, um, to the next propositions. Hello, my name is Debbie Mayo. My colleagues and I represent the Leagues of Women Voters of San Mateo County. I'll be presenting the pros and cons for state ballot measures 16, 17, and 18. They cover diversity and voting rights. Let's take a look at Proposition 16 first. Proposition 16 allows diversity as a factor in public employment, education, and contracting decisions. It is a legislative constitutional amendment. A legislative constitutional amendment is an amendment that changes our state constitution and appears as a state ballot measure because the state legislature voted to put it before the voters. The way it is now, since 1996, when Proposition 209 passed, state and local entities are prohibited from using race and gender as means to minimize the underutilization of women and people of color. There are exceptions. State and local entities can consider sex when it is necessary as part of normal operations, such as staffing in a federal prison, which is a woman's correctional facility, or when a requirement to receive federal funding is that a portion of the contracts be rewarded to businesses owned by women or people of color. Before Proposition 209, state and local entities had policies and programs intended to increase opportunities for people who faced inequalities due to race, sex, color, or ethnicity. For example, state universities considered diversity when making admission decisions and state and local employment and recruitment policies were designed to increase the hiring of people of color and women. Since Proposition 209 was put in place, public entities have created or modified their policies and programs. An example would be state universities providing outreach and support programs for students who are first in their family to attend college or that they consider the location of the high school that the student attended. What Proposition 16 would do, it would repeal Section 31 of Article 1 of the California State Constitution, which was put in place when Proposition 209 was passed in 1996. It would amend the California Constitution to allow preferential treatment to individuals or groups on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the decision-making policies in public employment, education, and contracting. It does not alter state and federal laws guaranteeing equal protection and prohibiting unlawful discrimination. Fiscal impact of Proposition 16. 
there is no direct fiscal effect on state or local entities. And it's uncertain the fiscal effects in the future. It's unknown what future programs will do regarding the increase or decrease in costs. Arguments in favor of Proposition 16. All of us deserve equal opportunities to thrive and succeed. We need to expand access to good jobs and wages, regardless of gender, race, or ethnicity. Today, nearly all public contracts and jobs go to large companies run by older white males. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy. Small Main Street businesses have lost over a billion dollars because of the current law. And quotas are still prohibited. Arguments against Proposition 16. California has successful men and women of all races and ethnicities. Passing Proposition 16 would continue the stereotype that women and minorities can't make it on their own and need special preferences to succeed. The interpretation of underrepresented group can be misconstrued. Passing Proposition 16 would encourage state and local entities to reinstate costly bureaucracies and programs. Financial support of Proposition 16. For supporters, 10 million has been contributed from Opportunity for All Coalition, which is 50 plus current and former elected officials, 13 organizations, and UC regions. Opponents have contributed a quarter of a million dollars from Californians for Equal Rights, which is Wade Connerly, five current and former officials, and four organizations. Proposition 16, yes or no? A yes vote would repeal Section 31, Article 1 of the California State Constitution and would allow state programs to consider diversity in the decision-making process for public employment, education, and contracting. A no vote would let the Section 31, Article 1 of the California State Constitution stand, which prevents the consideration of diversity in the decision-making process. The pros and cons for Proposition 17. A legislative constitutional amendment is an amendment that changes our state constitution and appears as a state ballot measure because the state legislature voted to put it before the voters. The way it is now. In 1974, Proposition 10 was approved, which amended the California Constitution to disqualify persons from voting until their state imprisonment and state parole are completed. California is only one of three states that requires persons to complete both their prison and parole terms. 19 states allow persons on parole to vote. What Proposition 17 would do, it would amend the California Constitution to allow persons who have completed their state prison term and are on parole to vote. This would potentially affect approximately 49,000 parolees. Persons in state and federal prisons will continue to be restricted from voting. The fiscal impact of Proposition 17. There'll be increased county costs, like in the hundreds of thousands of dollars statewide for voter registration and ballot materials. And there will be increased one-time state costs, likely in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, to update voter registration cards and systems. Arguments in favor of Proposition 17. People who have completed their prison terms pay taxes at the local, state, and federal levels. They should have a voice in government. Restoring the right to vote while under parole is a way to encourage people to re-enter society and have a stake in their community. Civic engagement is connected to lower rates of recidivism. Arguments against Proposition 17. In California, Parole is a legal part of the prison term, 
and people must successfully complete parole, which is usually three years, in order to have completed their sentence, at which time their voting rights would be restored. About half of parolees commit additional felonies. Recently, prison reform measures have moved nonviolent felons into county jails. While in the county jails, they have the right to vote while serving their sentence. Financial support for Proposition 17. Supporters have contributed 0.4 million, and that comes from Free the Vote California, yes on Prop 17. And there is no financial support from opponents. Proposition 17, yes or no. A yes vote supports a change to the state constitution that would allow felons who have completed their prison term and are on parole to vote. A no vote would retain the current wording of the constitution prohibiting felons who are on parole from voting. Proposition 18 amends the California constitution to permit 17 year olds to vote in primary and special elections if they will turn 18 by the next general election. This is a legislative constitutional amendment. A legislative constitutional amendment is an amendment that changes our state constitution and appears as a state ballot measure because the state legislature voted to put it before the voters. The way it is now, in even numbered years, California holds two statewide elections, the primary and the general election. In either election, voters nominate or elect candidates for state and federal offices and consider statewide ballot measures. During the primary election, voters choose the candidates that will compete in the general election in the coming November. Only a citizen 18 years of age on the date of the election may vote. Typically, local governments hold elections at the same time as state elections. Voters elect local office holders and consider local ballot measures. A person may pre-register to vote at 16 or 17 years of age. A pre-registered voter will automatically become registered to vote when they turn 18 years old. 18 states, along with Washington, D.C., allow 17-year-olds who will be 18 by the time of the general election to vote in primary elections. As of June 2020, there are 108,000 17-year-olds pre-registered to vote in California. What Proposition 18 would do, it would amend the Constitution to permit 17-year-olds who will be 18 at the time of the next general election to vote in the primary and special elections. The fiscal impact of Proposition 18, increased costs for counties, likely between several hundreds of thousands of dollars and a million dollars every two years to send and process voting materials to eligible registered 17 year olds and increased one time costs to the state in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to update existing voter registration systems. Arguments in favor of Proposition 18. This election reform will allow first time voters to participate in the full election cycle, the primary election and the general election, and has the potential to boost youth participation in our elections. In the 2020 California primary election, youth voters aged 18 to 24 made up 14.5% of the population eligible to vote. However, only about 6% actually voted. Youth are extremely underrepresented in our electoral process. Studies show that voting is habit forming. Once someone votes in an election, they are more likely to vote again. Arguments against Proposition 18. 17 year olds are most likely still in high school and are under the influence of teachers who determine their grades and provide recommendation letters which will impact their future. This environment could influence 17 year old voters on school, tax and bond measures, typically on a primary ballot. 
17-year-olds are not legally adults. Federal and California governments have set the age of legal responsibility at 18. Restrictions are put on driver licenses of 16 and 17-year-olds due to concerns of maturity and judgment. Financial support of Proposition 18. Supporters have contributed about $95,000. There is no financial support noted for opponents. Proposition 18, yes or no. A yes vote would amend the Constitution to allow 17-year-olds to vote in primaries and special elections if they will be 18 at the time of the next general election. A no vote would retain the voting age of qualified persons to 18 years of age for any elections. Hello, my name is Carol Jensen. My colleagues and I represent the Leagues of Women Voters of San Mateo County. I'll be presenting the pros and cons for state ballot measures 20 and 25, the tough on crime measures. Let's begin first with a look at Prop 20. Proposition 20 deals with criminal justice. It would place new limits on some sentence reductions enacted a few years ago. It would allow some theft-related crimes to be charged as felonies, and it would create two new crimes, serial theft and organized retail theft. Both crimes could result in jail time. The way it is now is actually due to a 2011 U.S. Supreme Court ruling stating that overcrowding in California prisons resulted in cruel and unusual punishment and therefore, the ruling ordered a reduction in the prison population. AB 109, Prop 47, which voters approved in 2014, and finally, Prop 57 were all passed in an effort to find a safe, effective way to reduce prison overcrowding. Currently, theft crimes can be charged as misdemeanors if the amount is less than $950. That's part of Prop 47. Right now, parole and post-release community supervision practices for released prisoners of violent crimes allow parole breakers to be returned to jail. Prop 57, passed four years ago, offered a chance of parole to some serving prison sentences for crimes that don't fall on the state's list of violent crimes. These inmates would be considered for release after serving the term for their primary crime. What Prop 20 would do is this. It would change penalties for serial theft and organized crime theft with a value of more than $250. Some felony charges would apply here. It creates a list of criteria for the Board of Parole hearings to use in considering whether to grant parole to an inmate convicted of a nonviolent crime. For example, a judge must change the terms of supervision if parole is broken three times. Also, it would allow prosecutors to review information about the inmate and to review the board's decision. And then it would allow victims' families to participate in parole review. Prop 20 would also change release categories from Prop 57, actually expanding the list of violent crimes for which there is no early release. This would include sex trafficking of a child and felony domestic violence. And it would expand DNA testing to require samples be taken from some people convicted of theft, such as shoplifting, also check forgery, and domestic violence. And importantly, it would require three-fourths majority in both houses of the state legislature to amend this law should Prop 20 pass. Precise costs are difficult to estimate. Depending on which aspects of Prop 20 are implemented, Costs could amount to less than 1% of the state's annual budget, but because it would result in an increase in the prison population and change the way that post-release supervision is handled, Prop 20 would increase state and local costs by tens of millions of dollars annually. As for arguments for and against Prop 20, here's what supporters say. It would prevent the early release of violent offenders and sexual predators by making 28 additional crimes violent, according to the penal code, bringing the total to 51 crimes listed as violent in the penal code. It also would require the victims be notified when their assailants are set free. Those in favor 
Abbott Prop 20 would not add to the prison population. It would simply prevent certain inmates convicted of violent crimes from being released early. Opponents say this proposition, if passed, would roll back prison reforms and it would cost taxpayers millions of dollars annually. It would also slash prison mental health and rehab programs, and it would result in extreme sentences for petty theft, impacting vulnerable minorities. Opponents call Prop 20 a prison spending scam at a time when we're actively closing prisons and reallocating funds toward what's needed in communities. Also, opponents say the system is already profoundly biased against minorities, and this would return California to the era of mass incarceration. Financial support looks like this. At least $4 million has been spent on the Yes on 20 campaign. The California Correctional Peace Officers Association has contributed about half of that. Opponents have spent at least $2.5 million. Californians Against Prison Spending Scam has spent $2 million, while the Committee for California Issues has spent about $300,000 to defeat Prop 20. And finally, Prop 20, yes or no? A yes vote supports this initiative to add crimes to the list of violent felonies for which early parole is restricted. It recategorizes certain types of theft and fraud crimes, and it would require DNA collection for certain misdemeanors. A no vote opposes this initiative, expanding the number of felonies considered violent for which early parole is restricted. Certain theft and fraud crimes would be categorized differently. Also, Prop 20 would require DNA samples to be taken from people convicted of certain misdemeanors. And that's a look at the pros and cons for Proposition 20. Pros and cons of State Ballot Measure 25. This is actually a referendum on a law that replaced cash bail with a system based on public safety and flight risk. It's a special kind of ballot measure asking voters whether to approve or reject a law passed by the legislature. In this case, it is the fate of a 2018 law abolishing cash bail in California. Companies and the Political Action Committee representing the bail industry quickly gathered signatures for this referendum after Senate Bill 10 was signed into law. As a result, SB 10 has been on hold and is awaiting a final decision by voters. The state constitution currently mandates that people arrested and sent to county jail have the right to release before trial, except for those charged with certain felony crimes. They may be released under their own recognizance when risk has been determined to be low, and they can be released by paying bail. Two years ago, Senate Bill 10 was passed calling for the elimination of cash bail and changing the process for release from jail before trial. The day after, Governor Jerry Brown signed SB 10. This veto referendum, Prop 25, was filed to overturn that bill. Now, this referendum recites SB 10 in its entirety, and Prop 25, in the form of a citizen-initiated measure, asks voters to approve SB 10. On the one hand, you have a law set to be enacted, passed two years ago in the state legislature. On the other hand, you have bail bonds companies who put this referendum on the ballot, actually hoping it will be defeated in order to protect the cash bail system and its industry. So, Prop 25 would eliminate release from county jail on bail. It would eliminate the release of most misdemeanor prisoners after 12 hours in jail. Instead of cash bail, SB 10 calls for risk assessments to determine which people charged with felonies and some misdemeanors can be safely released. Those considered high risk charged with violent crimes such as murder or arson would be detained in jail until arraignment. State trial courts would be responsible for performing these risk assessments. Here's a look at the fiscal impact. There would be increased state and local pretrial costs in the mid hundreds of millions of dollars annually. There would be decreased county jail costs, competing effects on state and local taxes. The total impact, however, here is unknown. 
but there would be a loss of taxes on bail bond fees. And on the other hand, increased spending by those who have been released and who no longer have to pay bail bonds. As for arguments in favor of Prop 25, proponents who are in favor of enacting SB 10 say bail money is unfair, dangerous, and costly. Bail favors the rich who can afford to buy their freedom while they await trial, while those without wealth must stay in jail because they simply don't have the means to pay cash bail. Under this system, supporters of Prop 25 say dangerous criminals can be back on the streets once they're out on bail. Those jailed for misdemeanors would be released right away, decreasing the county jail population. Now, opponents who actually put Prop 25 on the ballot are hoping it will be defeated, therefore eliminating SB 10. They do, however, agree with supporters, also calling Prop 25 unfair, dangerous, and costly, but for different reasons. They argue that it eliminates the right to bail, that a risk assessment program is actually a computer-based algorithm which can lead to profiling and could be biased against minorities and the poor. It would be very costly, calling for the creation of a new bureaucratic network within the state court system. Speaking of cost, here's a look at financial support. Supporters have raised at least $8.3 million, this money coming from an organization called End Predatory and Unfair Money Bail. Also, various federal and state Democratic legislators and unions have contributed. Opponents have raised at least $5.4 million in an effort to defeat Proposition 25, which again would defeat SB 10. A political action committee called Californians Against the Reckless Bail Scheme, plus bail bond companies and insurance firms, many of which own bail businesses, have all contributed to this total. So to review, a yes vote on Proposition 25 would uphold Senate Bill 10, legislation which was passed two years ago, but immediately contested in the form of a referendum. And again, a yes vote on this measure means cash bail would be replaced with risk assessments for detained suspects in county jail who are awaiting trial. A no vote seeks to repeal SB 10, keeping in place the cash bail system for those in county jail, hoping to be released while they wait to stand trial. And that's a look at the pros and cons for Proposition 25. Hi there. We'll uh, now address your questions for Propositions 16, which have to do with, which has to do with affirmative action. Number 17, which is voting rights for ex-convicts and 18, which is voting rights for 17 year olds in primaries. Um, so far in the chat room, I haven't seen any questions about uh, those propositions. So Pam, I think you're off the hook for the moment. If something else comes up, we'll let you know. <laughs> and Carol, there is a question uh, on Prop 20. Uh, a viewer wants to know who are the individuals, if you know, <laughs> in the different groups that are supporting and opposing Prop 20. Uh, it's hard to tell. It is hard to tell because yeah. a lot of them are PACs, right? They're political action committees. Um, and so, for instance, the correctional, the California Correctional Peace Officers Association um, is uh, one of the PACs that's given a lot of money to this proposition, Prop 20. Opponents, and I just want to throw this in um, before I get to the answer, because the, the, the number has changed substantially. Um, so those in support of Prop 20, the California Correctional Peace Officers Association, basically law enforcement, have contributed about $4 million. And then those opposing it, um, you know, a few weeks ago, it was two and a half million dollars. That figure has now grown to $5.6 million. Well, who are these people? They call themselves Californians Against the Prison Spending Scam and also the Committee for California Issues. But if you dig a little deeper, you will find out that uh, Jerry Brown, former California governor, of course, Jerry Brown and the ACLU are 
part of uh, that group that opposes Proposition 20. Um, and just one little bit quick note on Jerry Brown, because I came across this in um, some research and I thought it was funny because it said, Governor Jerry Brown was famously allergic to talk of his legacy while in office. But if the former governor has one, it might be the effort that he spent in the final two years of as governor supporting efforts to reverse the tough on crime policies that he had originally helped to introduce during his first two terms in the 70s and the 80s. So as you can see, things change, things never stay the same. And that's a big part of the reason why we're all here today. And we're all trying to figure out what to do with our ballots. Linda. Thank you. Well, Pam, we've got one for you. Uh, on Proposition 16, um, the viewer is confused about a, a, what a yes vote will do. Does it expand preferential treatment for minorities? Um, or could you sort of recap that idea? Yeah, I think the quickest note about Proposition 16 is that currently the state and local governments aren't allowed to use um, sex, ethnicity, national origin, or race in terms of making contract decisions. Um, so they can't say, oh, we really wanna give a contract to 20% businesses owned by minority owners. They can't do that right now. It's, it's against the rules. So what Proposition 16 would do is it would allow the government to set rules or targets like that. They are not quotas. So it wouldn't be going to I think one of the biggest arguments against affirmative action was people were worried that students were being um, kept out of universities because there were quotas and they weren't meeting the quotas for certain racial or minority groups. But that's not what this is. That's still against the law. What Proposition 16 would do is open the doors for having things like race, sex, and national origin as criteria. Um, for getting government contracts or spending. Um, so I'm not sure how to specifically say, does it expand preferential treatment? Um, opponents say that it does. Supporters say that it um, allows governments to even the playing field. Thank you very much, Pam. I think that's all the questions we have now for uh, these propositions and uh, if we can have the video back to go forward on the um, uh, last segment of this um, video, we can look at uh, the propositions 22 through 24, 14, 21, and measure RR. Hello, my name is Pamela Schwartz. My colleagues and I represent the League of Women Voters of San Mateo County. I will be presenting the pros and cons for state ballot measures 22, 23, and 24. Let's look at Prop 22 first. Proposition 22 would allow app-based drivers like people who drive for Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash to be treated as independent contractors. It does outline some additional benefits for drivers, but it exempts the app companies from having to provide benefits employees in California are entitled to. So let's start with the way it works now. Back in 2019, the California State Legislature passed Assembly Bill 5, which imposes strict requirements on who can be classified as an independent contract worker instead of an employee. This law impacts most employers in the state with a few specific exceptions, but it made the news because it would mean that app companies like Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash would have to classify their drivers as employees and provide them with benefits like minimum wage, paid sick leave, unemployment benefits, and workers' compensation. Since the passage of AB5, app companies have continued to treat their drivers as independent contractors and are currently being sued by the state of California. So the app companies have put forward Proposition 22 to try and settle the matter in their favor. Before we go into what Prop 22 would do, I want to note that AB5 affects all industries in California, but Proposition 22 would only apply to app-based transportation and delivery drivers. Essentially, if Prop 22 passes, it would mean that AB5 does not apply to app-based drivers. The drivers would be considered independent contractors and given some benefits, but not everything the law currently requires. 
The chart here shows how Prop 22 proposes to treat app drivers and how it differs from AB5. First, AB5 requires drivers be paid at least minimum wage, earn overtime, and have expenses reimbursed. Prop 22 would guarantee 120% minimum wage and some mileage reimbursement. It's important to know that the wage calculations here are slightly different because minimum wage under AB5 includes the time drivers are logged into the app and waiting for passengers, but Prop 22's wage calculation would only apply to active driving time. Aside from pay, healthcare is a major concern for workers. AB5 would require app companies to provide an employer healthcare option. Prop 22 would reimburse drivers who work 15 to 24 hours per week for 50% of a covered California bronze health plan. And drivers who work 25 hours or more per week would get 100% of a bronze tier health plan. If you haven't used the health insurance marketplace in California, think like the Olympics. Bronze plans are cheaper than silver and gold plans. AB5 requires that employees are offered workers' compensation when they are injured on the job, paid family leave, paid sick days, and unemployment insurance. In contrast, Prop 22 would not provide any of that, but it would provide accident insurance for drivers and implement anti-discrimination policies and driver training in things like accident avoidance and recognizing and reporting sexual assault or misconduct. Finally, AB5 allows for union rights with a state law change, but Prop 22 requires a 7 8 supermajority vote for drivers to unionize. So how will Prop 22 affect the state's finances? The predicted fiscal impact of Prop 22 is that there will be a slight increase in income taxes paid by rideshare drivers and investors who own stock in rideshare and delivery companies. The idea is that the app companies would be doing more business and seeing more profits because they did not have to provide the more expensive benefits required by AB5. This slight increase in income taxes assumes that the courts in California would decide that app companies need to treat drivers as employees if Prop 22 does not pass. I also wanna point out that Uber CEO and Lyft's president have said that the companies could suspend rideshare operations in California for a few months or a year if they have to comply with AB5. They have suspended service in other areas that have attempted regulation. For example, Lyft and Uber shut down in Austin, Texas from May 2016 to May 2017 after the city passed an ordinance requiring driver background checks. The service resumed when the Texas governor signed a law that preempted Austin's ordinance. The companies have also indicated that if they had to comply with AB5, they would not be able to have as many drivers as they do now. So that could also affect the finances. So should we allow app-based drivers to be independent contractors? Supporters say that Proposition 22 protects the choice of app-based drivers to work as independent contractors. It means they can work other jobs and set their own hours. Supporters claim that Prop 22 improves app-based work by requiring companies to provide some new benefits like the healthcare subsidies and accident insurance. They also claim Prop 22 has expanded public safety protections by implementing policies on anti-discrimination and sexual harassment and requiring criminal background checks for drivers. Opponents say that Prop 22 creates a special exemption for app companies like Uber and Lyft that eliminates basic workplace benefits and replaces them with a new lower earnings guarantee and healthcare subsidy. Remember back to the earlier slide comparing benefits. AB5 calculates minimum wage for the time spent in the app well, Prop 22 only includes active driving time. Opponents claim that over 70% of drivers work 30 or more hours per week already, and the existing law wouldn't impede flexibility. This assumes that the app companies would be willing to allow employees to set their own hours if they have to provide paid time off and overtime pay. In a Wall Street Journal article, Lyft claimed that 86% of their more than 300,000 drivers drive fewer than 20 hours per week. This discrepancy could be because opponents include all time spent in the app as working hours, while the companies are counting active driving time only. A lot of money has been pledged for Proposition 22. Supporters have given almost $200 million, while opponents have given less than $10 million. Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash each gave almost $50 million to fund the proposition, while Maple Bear Inc., which does business as Instacart, gave $28 million, and Postmates gave $10 million in support. Workers' unions have provided the largest donations to oppose Proposition 22. The top four donors are the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, the United Healthcare Workers West, the Service Employee Union, and California Labor Federation. Given the amount of money that has been spent, 
I imagine we'll be seeing more ads about Prop 22 as we get closer to the election. To sum it up, a yes vote supports this ballot initiative to define app-based transportation or rideshare and delivery drivers as independent contractors and adopt labor and wage policies specific to app-based drivers and companies. A no vote opposes this ballot initiative meaning AB5 could be used to decide whether app-based drivers are employees or independent contractors. So a yes vote means you want app-based drivers to be considered independent contractors, and a no vote means you think AB5 should be used to determine if drivers need to be treated as employees. Proposition 23 would require kidney dialysis clinics to have a physician on premises while patients are being treated and require clinics to send quarterly reports on infections to a state agency. It would also require state approval before a clinic could be closed. For those who don't know, kidney dialysis is a treatment that filters the blood in people whose kidneys can no longer function adequately. People with end-stage kidney failure need dialysis treatments to stay alive. Patients usually get three dialysis treatments per week, and each one lasts at least three hours. So there are approximately 600 licensed clinical dialysis centers operating in California, and they serve about 80,000 patients per month. Under federal rules, the patient's doctor must visit them during dialysis clinic treatments at least once per month. DaVita Inc. and Fresenius Medical own or operate about 72% of licensed dialysis clinics in California. It's estimated that dialysis clinics have revenues exceeding $3 billion. Most dialysis is paid for by Medicare and Medi-Cal, or private insurance. You may remember Proposition 8 from 2018, which tried to limit the profits dialysis clinics are able to make. It was one of the most expensive ballot propositions in California history and was voted down. Opponents claimed it was Service Employees International Union attempting to punish DeVita and Fresenius for discouraging unionization, and they make similar claims about Proposition 23 whereas the union claims staff working at dialysis clinics want to make sure patient safety is prioritized over profits. So they're proposing some additional regulations for dialysis clinics that will be overseen by the California Department of Public Health. The first is that dialysis centers must have a licensed physician on site during all hours of operation, unless there is a doctor shortage, in which case the clinic may operate with a nurse practitioner or physician assistant on site. Next, dialysis clinics would have to report dialysis-related infection information to the California Department of Public Health every three months. Dialysis clinics would also have to notify the Department of Public Health and get consent if they plan on decreasing service or closing a dialysis location. Finally, Proposition 23 would prohibit dialysis clinics from refusing care to a patient based on who is paying for the patient's treatment. This is important because different types of insurance will pay different rates for dialysis treatments. Medicare and Medi-Cal generally pay less than private insurance. Dialysis companies are currently fighting a law passed in 2019, known as AB 290, that would lower reimbursement rates for dialysis to Medicare levels and require health plans to accept premium payments from charities. The companies claim it is unconstitutional. It's another example of attempts to limit the profits of clinical dialysis centers. It's estimated that Prop 23 would increase costs for clinical dialysis centers and the state. Dialysis clinics would likely have to pay about $100,000 each for clinics to have an on-site physician. If increased rates are negotiated with payers, it would increase state costs by about $10 million per year. And the new oversight responsibilities for the California Department of Public Health would cost something in the low millions of dollars per year. Supporters say that Proposition 23 makes improvements to dialysis patient care by requiring a physician on premises and quarterly reporting of infections. It prevents arbitrary closures of clinics in rural areas by requiring state approval before a clinic can close. And it prevents discrimination against patients by not allowing clinics to treat them differently because of how they are paying for their treatments. Opponents say Proposition 23 would increase costs forcing closures. Clinics would have to hire doctors to be on premises and would also need staff to manage quarterly reporting to the state. They assert that dialysis clinics are already well-regulated by the federal government and don't require additional oversight by the state. Opponents also claim that requiring a doctor to be on premises when the dialysis clinic is treating patients would adversely impact ER and hospital doctor shortages. The proposition does allow for yearly waivers to be issued by the state 
if a particular area is experiencing a doctor shortage that makes it difficult to find a physician to meet the requirement of having a physician on premises. The Californians for Kidney Dialysis Patient Protection PAC was registered in support of Proposition 23. They raised about $6.1 million from the Service Employees International Union in support of Proposition 23. The opponents are funded by dialysis clinic operators, DeVita and Fresenius Medical Care. You can see that DeVita has spent $40 million, Fresenius spent $26 million, and the U.S. Renal Care spent $6.7 million. Non-financial supporters of Prop 23 include the California Labor Federation and the California Democratic Party, while non-financial opponents include the California Medical Association and the Republican Party. So to sum it up, a yes vote on Proposition 23 would mean dialysis clinics have an on-site physician while patients are being treated, report data on dialysis-related infections, obtain consent from the state health department before closing a clinic, and can't discriminate against patients based on the source of payment for care. A no vote on Proposition 23 opposes these additional requirements. In other words, a no vote would leave regulation of clinical dialysis centers as it currently is. Proposition 24 intends to strengthen the California Consumer Privacy Act that was passed in 2018 and establish a California Privacy Protection Agency to enforce the new law. On slide two, we have a short history to help you understand why Proposition 24 is on the ballot. In 1972, the state constitution was amended to include the right of privacy for all people. In 2018, a ballot initiative concerning consumer privacy was going to be on the ballot, but was withdrawn after the state legislature passed the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA. The CCPA gives consumers the right to learn what information is collected about them, like address, phone number, or geolocation, gives them the right to delete their personal information from a business's database, and to stop businesses from selling their information. The CCPA is why websites give you the option to accept cookies that collect or disseminate information about you online. California's CCPA went into effect in January of 2020 and is currently the strongest legislation of its kind in the country. Now, Alistair McTaggart, a San Francisco real estate developer who was a large contributor to the 2018 ballot initiative that paved the way for CCPA, has put forward Proposition 24 to protect the law from being weakened by opponents. There are differences between the existing California Consumer Privacy Act and Proposition 24. To give you an idea, Proposition 24 is a little over 50 pages long. Prop 24 would reduce the number of businesses that must meet the law's requirements by only requiring businesses that purchase, sell, or share personal information of 100,000 or more customers or households each year, which is up from 50,000 in the current law. Prop 24 also details exemptions for deleting consumer data. For example, businesses wouldn't delete data in order to comply with warrants, subpoenas, or federal, state, and local laws. Some consumer privacy advocates claim that Prop 24 makes it easier for businesses to refuse a consumer's request to delete their data if it believes keeping the data would help ensure security and integrity of their system. Proposition 24 adds new consumer privacy rights, like giving consumers the right to block data gathering sensitive information, like ethnicity, religion, and precise geolocation. It also has requirements to request permission before collecting data on minors age 16 or younger. The most obvious difference from current law is that Prop 24 would create a new state agency in charge of imposing penalties on businesses that do not comply with privacy regulations. Right now, the state attorney general enforces the CCPA. Businesses have 30 days to remedy a violation before having to pay a penalty. Prop 24 would immediately impose financial penalties for data breaches caused by negligence. Fines would be tripled for violations involving a person under the age of 16. Proceeds from fines and related settlements would be deposited into a consumer privacy fund, which would be used to offset costs to courts, the Attorney General, and the California Privacy Protection Agency that are associated with enforcing the consumer data law. That leads us into the discussion of the fiscal impact of Proposition 24. Setting up a new state agency costs money, 
and Proposition 24 allocates $10 million annually from the State General Fund for the California Privacy Protection Agency. Supporters of Prop 24 claim that the agency costs would be offset by the proceeds from fines and settlements with businesses who violate the consumer privacy requirements. Opponents claim that the creation of another state agency to regulate businesses is an unnecessary financial burden. Some consumer advocacy groups would prefer that Prop 24 allow for consumers to sue businesses individually, rather than create an agency to go after violators. Supporters of Prop 24 believe a ballot initiative is necessary to protect consumer privacy laws so that future changes to the law that do not strengthen privacy will have to go to the voters. Alistair McTaggart brought the proposition to the ballot in an attempt to prevent lobbyists from large businesses from weakening the CCPA. He said, quote, there's basically unlimited resources on one side of the fight. If you don't do anything, they will win eventually. Opponents claim that it is too soon to be making changes to the California Consumer Privacy Act since it went into effect on January 1st of 2020. Not all consumer privacy groups support Proposition 24. One complaint is that it opens the door to pay for privacy, where businesses could charge consumers more for exercising their right to privacy. The CCPA does not allow this currently. Other consumer privacy groups object to Proposition 24 because it was written with input from technology companies in private meetings. I think the Electronic Frontier Foundation phrased it best when it issued a statement taking no position on Proposition 24. It described the ballot initiative as a, quote, mixed bag of partial steps backwards and forwards. One thing I found interesting about this proposition is that it would affect large companies like Google and Facebook, but there has been relatively little spending on Proposition 24. As you can see, so far, the only reported spending in support of Prop 24 has been by Alistair McTaggart, who has given about $5 million. Opponents have given less than $1 million. To get an idea of who is supporting or opposing this proposition, I recommend reviewing the websites for the Yes on 24 and No on 24 committees. Each site lists well-known people and organizations who support their stance. Yes on 24 notables include former presidential candidates Andrew Yang and Tom Steyer, Common Sense Media, the NAACP, and the California Professional Firefighters. No on 24 notables include labor icon Dolores Huerta, ACLU of California, Consumer Federation of California, Californians for Privacy Now, and Color of Change. If you think that the proposition put forward by Alistair McTaggart does in fact strengthen consumer privacy rights in California, and you agree that a state agency should be set up to monitor and enforce consumer privacy protections, vote yes on Proposition 24. If you want consumer privacy protection to remain as it is and be updated by the state legislature without a vote by the people, then vote no on Proposition 24. Hello, my name is Bob Barrett. My colleagues and I represent the Leagues of Women Voters of San Mateo County. I will be presenting the pros and cons for State Ballot Measure 14 and 21, and also the Tri-County Ballot Measure RR, which relates to Caltrain. Proposition 14 seeks to have the state of California sell additional bonds for the support of stem cell research. This is a citizen proposed initiative. The current situation is this. In 2004, voters passed Proposition 71 to create the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, CIRM. Proposition 71 amended the California Constitution and changed the Health and Safety Code. Prop 71 allowed the state to borrow $3 billion in bonds for the research. As of June 2020, almost all the funds have been spent, with most of the grants awarded to Stanford University and the University of California. The formation of the Institute allowed California to take on a role usually fulfilled by the US government. This was considered necessary because there was a federal ban on stem cell research with federal money. The CIRM is using general obligation funds, usually funds directed to brick and mortar projects such as bridges and hospitals. It is very unusual to have a, the public request a bond to fund scientific research 
and then have an independent entity, the Institute, channel state money to research institutions and scientists. There has been some controversy about the management of Institute funds and their grant procedures. Their board has revamped the processes. One independent analyst gave the opinion that CIRM would be collaborative and patient-centered and is now more efficient and effective. Grant recipients who license or sell their inventions are required to share a portion of the income with California. To date, these inventions have provided approximately $350,000 to the state. Here are the activities that would occur if Proposition 14 is approved. Briefly, stem cells have the unique ability to generate specialized cell types in the human body. Research has led to a greater understanding of how diseases in humans occur and how to generate new cells to replace diseased cells. Approval of Proposition 14 would continue to fund stem cell and other research to develop treatments and cures for serious diseases and conditions like diabetes, cancer, HIV, AIDS, heart disease, paralysis, blindness, kidney disease, and respiratory diseases. About $1.5 billion would be dedicated to research for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, and epilepsy. In addition, medical training in related fields and building medical research facilities would be supported. Proposition 14 mandates that in addition to supporting research at California State Universities, funds would be awarded to community colleges for training programs. It also establishes a fellowship program for graduate and postgraduate stem cell research programs. Proposition 14 sets limits on the bond funds that can be used for administrative purposes. Prop 14 also provides for the phased sale of bonds to a limit of $540 million annually. This spreads the sale of bonds over an 11-year period. Prop 14 would also focus on improving access to treatments and cures for underserved communities and caps the number of full-time CIRM employees. Here is the assessment of the Legislative Analyst's Office of the fiscal impact of Prop 14. It basically states the cost to the state of issuing the bonds. For $5.5 billion in general obligation bonds, the total cost to taxpayers, $7.8 billion, is the principal and interest paid by the state over a 25-year period. This would average about $260 million per year paid from the general fund. There is also the possibility of revenue for new inventions, but that is uncertain. There also could be indirect fiscal effects for some healthcare programs, such as Medi-Cal, but the net fiscal impact is unknown. Here are the arguments for and against Prop 14. Supporters say Prop 14 has led to significant advances in treatments and cures for many diseases. 92 clinical trials and 2,900 discoveries were made during past years. Continuing bonds for stem cell research is supported by 70 patient advocacy groups. The accountability and transparency of CIRM is increased Prop 14 would contribute to the rebound of the California economy. Through 2018, the Institute funded research projects have attracted over $3 billion in matching funds and created over 55,000 jobs. It has generated about $10.7 billion in economic stimulus and over $6 million in state and local tax revenue. New revenues and jobs will be generated by additional funding. Prop 14 will also increase patient access and affordable treatments and provide patients some financial assistance. Opponents say that other entities can do a better job on these research issues. For example, NIH, that's the National Institutes of Health, spends $1.5 billion annually on this type of research. Prop 71 was intended to be a temporary measure and now that the federal government is providing funding, it is no longer necessary for California to fund this research. In addition, private companies and investors are also involved in funding stem cell research. Opponents also question CIRM transparency and effectiveness. Supporters have raised about $6.6 .6 million. They include Californians for Stem Cell Research, Treatment and Cures, 
Robert N. Klein II, a real estate investor and stem cell research advocate, is the largest donor, contributing $4.6 million. Dagmar Dolby, a private family foundation, contributed $2 million. Opponents have not listed any contributions at this time. Proposition 14, will you vote yes or no? A yes vote supports issuing $5.5 billion in general obligation bonds for the State Stem Cell Research Institute and making changes to the Institute's governance structure and programs. A no vote opposes issuing $5.5 billion in general obligation bonds for the State Stem Cell Research Institute. Proposition 21 seeks to expand the authority of local governments to enact rent control on residential property. This ballot measure was derived from a voter petition and is considered an initiative statute. Here is the way the rent control scene exists now. The Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act limits application of local housing rental laws to the following, single family homes and housing built after 1995 and allows rent increases without limit when a renter first moves in. While the ability of city governments is limited by state and federal constitutions and laws, Costa Hawkins increased these regulations. On the November 2018 ballot, Prop 10 would have repealed Costa Hawkins. However, it was defeated 59% to 41%. We know that rental housing is very expensive in California because the supply is limited. Unlike single family home prices, rental prices did not decrease much during the 2008 recession. It is not yet clear what will happen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The cities of San Francisco, San Jose, and Los Angeles do have rent control laws, but even these cities are experiencing an increase in the number of units rented at current market rates when a new tenant moves in. This is allowed under Costa Hawkins when a tenant vacates a unit. In addition, court rulings allow landlords to receive profits each year known as a fair rate of return. Let's look at what Prop 21 intends to do if approved. It would modify the Costa Hawkins law so that counties and cities may, if they wish to do so, place rent control on homes that are more than 15 years old, that is built in 2004 or earlier. Landlords who own and rent three or more single family homes may have rent control issues. However, landlords owning one or two rental homes will be exempt. Rent control may be applied to new tenant rental prices, but does allow a 15% increase over three years to that new lease. Thus, the court mandate of keeping a fair rate of return for landlords is honored. Again, Proposition 21 amends Costa Hawkins rather than getting rid of it. Rent control would be allowed to apply to all property more than 15 years old as opposed to just pre-1995 properties. Costa Hawkins excludes rent control for single family homes. With Prop 21, rent control can be applied if the property owner has more than two single family homes used as rental properties. Under Prop 21, rent control could also limit increases in rental rates after a unit is vacated. Here is the analysis of the Legislative Analyst's Office for the fiscal impact of Prop 21 if it is passed. Overall, the measure likely would reduce state and local revenues over time, with the largest effect being on property taxes if landlords sold their rental units at a lower value. However, it is difficult to predict fiscal impact because of the number of factors in play, such as the extent to which cities and counties change their rental laws or whether landlords keep their properties or sell them to live-in owners. Other consequences may occur, such as the value of rental properties may decline, reducing property taxes collected. Landlords may postpone or ignore property maintenance to reduce their costs. If some renters will be paying less rent, landlords would receive less income, thus reducing state income taxes collected. And some renters may choose to stay in rent controlled apartments rather than move out, even if they could afford to pay more. Here are the arguments for and against approving Prop 21. Supporters say that Prop 21 will save taxpayers money by reducing homelessness. It will have the consequence of keeping rental housing costs down, bringing stability to seniors, families, and veterans. Further, communities are diverse and capable of deciding whether their situation warrants rent controls. 
Even with Prop 21, landlords are guaranteed a reasonable profit. Prop 21 is supported by a broad coalition of elected officials, labor unions, civic organizations, national social justice groups, and so forth. Opponents of Prop 21 argue that it will not address the housing shortage, will not reduce rents, and therefore provides no protections for seniors, families, and veterans. Further, Prop 21 takes away basic protections for homeowners, treating them like corporate landlords. Here is what is known about the financial contributions to Prop 21. Supporters gave at least $16.8 million under Yes on 21, renters and homeowners united to keep families in their homes. Almost all of the money was contributed by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, which had put Prop 10 on the ballot in 2018. 134 elected officials and 87 organizations are supporting Prop 21. The Los Angeles Times is in favor of Prop 21. Opponents of Prop 21 formed a group called No on 21 and have contributed $47 million. This group represents 134 organizations and one elected official. The biggest contributors are rental management companies and real estate developers. Essex Property Trust, $6.6 million. Equity Residential, $5.5 million. Avalon Bay Communities, $4.4 million and California Business Roundtable, $3.5 million. Six other real estate groups have given over $1 million each. Donations may have increased since this slide was created. Newspaper editorials in the Orange County Journal, the San Jose Mercury, the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, and the San Francisco Chronicle are against Proposition 21. So, Prop 21, yes or no? A yes vote will make changes to the Costa-Hawkins Act to allow cities and counties the ability to make rent control laws on previously restricted properties. A no vote will leave the law unchanged and prevent any new rent control activities. Measure RR was placed on the ballot by the legislature and is entitled Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board Caltrain Sales Tax Measure. Because Measure RR is asking for increased taxes, it requires a two-thirds majority of all voters in the three counties to pass, per Proposition 13 and the state constitution. Here is the current situation. 70% of Caltrain funding comes from fares. Caltrain is the only passenger rail service in the country that relies on voluntary contributions from each of the three counties it passes through. County contributions total about $30 million. Additional contributions for Caltrain come from member agencies like the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority, VTA, the San Mateo County Transit District, SAMTRANS, and the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Authority, MUNI. Due to COVID-19, ridership is down 95%. Caltrain is kept alive by the temporary CARES Act, but there are no funds to continue the electrification program. Jerry Hill had sponsored SB 797 to fund Caltrain, but allowed the ballot measure to go ahead. It was signed by the Transit Authorities and the Joint Powers Board. The Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board, Caltrain, is an independent agency responsible for operations, capital projects, and planning for the three county train services on the San Francisco Peninsula. The three funding partners are the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority, the San Mateo County Transit District, SAMTRANS, and the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Authority. What does Measure RR propose to do? It authorizes a sales tax of 0.125%, one eighth of a cent, in the counties of Santa Clara and San Mateo, and the city and county of San Francisco for a period of 30 years. Because this is a tax measure, it requires a two-thirds majority of voters to approve it. It is estimated to raise about $108 million per year. With this new tax, a dedicated source of revenue will be obtained to fund the operating and capital expenses of the Caltrain rail service, and for no other purposes. This allows Caltrain to increase peak and off-peak service and would provide subsidies that would make train service accessible to riders of all income levels. The Joint Powers Board will develop guidelines for and will administer 
the collected funds for the purposes intended. The fiscal impact of Measure RR is as follows. It makes a step toward Caltrain being self-sustaining with no impact locally besides sales tax. A 30-year, one-eighth of a cent tax across the three counties will generate approximately $100 million per year. The revenue collected will cover the annual $30 million in contributions from the three counties for operations funding and provide roughly 60 to $70 million per year to fund the aging system's ongoing maintenance needs and to build new infrastructure that will in greatly increase the capacity and efficiency of services. The new sales tax of one eighth of a cent is applied to purchases that are usually taxed and to taxed uses. You can see the increase in taxes across the counties in the graph comparing the current tax rate and when the 0.125% increase is applied. Here are the arguments for and against measure RR. Supporters say, most importantly, the tax will save Caltrain from ceasing operations. Further, it will improve the system with more trains and better connections with BART. It will continue to keep about 65,000 cars off the road. There will be strict fiscal accountability. Opponents say pension and personnel costs have made the Caltrain budget difficult to meet. As always, it should be remembered that sales taxes are regressive and hurt the poorest communities most. Furthermore, Caltrain serves affluent riders whose fares should not be subsidized. No reportable contributions have been made at this time for or against Measure RR. Measure RR, yes or no. Measure RR requires a two thirds majority of yes votes to pass. To help you remember what this measure is about, RR stands for railroad. A yes vote is a vote to approve a sales tax of 0.125%, one eighth of a cent for 30 years in the counties of San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara. A no vote is a vote to not approve the sales tax. Hi there. So we'll um, entertain questions on the propositions um, 22 through 24, 14, 21, and Measure RR in just a moment. There have been several um, queries about getting the slides so that people can review them in this uh, slower, in a slower paced fashion. The individual propositions are listed on the League of Women Voters uh, website. And so if you go there, you can Google League of Women Voters South San Mateo County or put in LWVSSMC and you'll get to our website, look for the propositions section and um, you'll be able to pick up any of the propositions that you're interested in because it's a YouTube video you can slow it down, you can pause it, you can do whatever you want to look at the slides. And so that's my suggestion for doing that. Um, we have, Pam, some, uh, some questions for uh, you on Props 22 and uh, 23. Um, the first one, uh, let me get scroll here. Okay, this is on 22. Um, a viewer says AB5 has impacted all independent contractors like riders and many others. Why are drivers different than other independent contractors and why should they be singled out as exempt from AB5 when others aren't? I think that's a great question. Uh, the short answer is Prop 22 it considers them exempt because it was written by the driving app companies. So Uber and Lyft wrote Proposition 22 and they got it on the ballot um, and they really care about their businesses. So that's what they did. Um, AB5 does affect all independent contractors. It does have a lot, of, um, a lot of industries that are exempt from it. So a lot of white collar uh, independent contractors like accountants, even dentists, um, are exempt from AB5. 
Um, and then there are other industries that have to abide by different rules for who can be determined to be an independent contractor versus an employee. Um, so hairstylists are often independent contractors as the question mentioned. Um, writers are often independent contractors. And so AB5 um, affected a lot of different people. I know the Orange County Register uh, suggested that people vote for Proposition 22 to send a message that they did not like uh, AB5. Um, so supporters of Proposition 22 say app-based drivers should be different because they're gig workers and it's a new section of our economy that should be treated differently. And opponents say that they're workers and they should be given the rights that workers in California are entitled to. Um, so that's where you have to make the decision. Thank you, Pam. Um, on Prop 23, um, is there an issue about how many patients are turned down per year for insurance reasons? If they can't pay for care, if they can, can they receive care elsewhere besides these dialysis clinics? That's a good question. It's kind of what problem are they trying to solve with Proposition 23? Um, I wasn't able to get statistics on how many people have uh, troubles paying for dialysis and how many people get turned away. But um, the meat of it is that dialysis clinics are typically for-profit medical companies. Um, they have very high profits every year. And in contrast, the, the government is trying to reduce healthcare costs. Um, so in California, they recently passed a bill in 2019 that would limit what um, dialysis clinics could charge to the Medicare level. And that's currently being fought in the courts. Um, so I think really what 23 is trying to address is limiting the profits of the dialysis clinics. So supporters of Prop 23 would say that um, it allows for um, reasonable payments for dialysis clinics and additional doctors on staff to make them safer. And um, opponents of Proposition 23 would say that it's not right to limit uh, what they can charge and that uh, forcing them to have more doctors on staff uh, is just going to force them to close centers. And I think that's what you see on a lot of the ads on TV now. Um, it's dialysis patients saying, oh, I don't want my center to close. Um, so I hope I answered the question there. That's just so much background information. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and as you point out, dialysis centers are, are mostly privately owned for-profit businesses. Yeah, and with healthcare, it gets so complicated. How do you pay? Who pays? What do they pay? Um, if you have private insurance, they typically will pay more for dialysis treatments, whereas Medicare and Medi-Cal will pay less per consumer. Um, and so I think what's happening now is a lot of dialysis clinics have set up charities that will pay for someone's dialysis, but they pay through a private insurance. And so they end up paying the companies more for people's dialysis. Whereas if they were only allowed to charge a certain amount for dialysis, it would be different. That's kind of sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> it is, that's why they did the law in 2019, but yeah. whether the law is actually constitutional is under question. So I, I think we remember back in 2018, they also tried to have a ballot proposition that limited the profits of dialysis companies. And it's a really tricky thing because dialysis patients really need these uh, treatments to live. <laughs> so yeah, it's a question. Um, another 23 question, Pam. Um, do, do we understand why CMA and CNA are supporting the No on 23? Do they actually receive funding from DaVita? Do we have any information on that? No, I don't have much. I know back in 2018, CMA and CNA were also on the side of DaVita um, in, in terms of not limiting profits of dialysis centers. So I'm not entirely sure if they receive funding or if it's just kind of a mutual relationship between the two and they're on the same side. Thank you. Um, so and Prop 22, Pam, take a deep breath. You've got another one. How are taxi drivers different from Uber and Lyft and Instacart drivers financially? So taxi drivers 
are part of our drivers for a different company or they are drivers for themselves. So taxi drivers are a well-established industry. They have their own regulations about how they get paid, the taxes they have to pay and all of that. Um, whereas Uber, Lyft and Instacart drivers are part of this new gig economy where you go onto an app and you say, I'm going to do this task to be paid this much money. Um, and so Prop 22 is really getting at the question of how do we want these people to be treated? Do we want people who work for these apps to be treated as employees? Or do we want them to continue to be sort of at the mercy of the companies that are sending the jobs out, providing the gigs? Um, so taxi drivers are different. Taxi drivers are not Uber or Lyft drivers. They have their own regulations. They're not affected by Proposition 22 in so far as um, it doesn't affect them directly, although their industry would obviously be affected by the outcome of Proposition 22. Thank you very much. We don't seem to have any other questions. So I think that we'll probably call this session to a close. We just thank you for all hanging in and it's a long, it's a long session, but we uh, hope that it was useful to you and that you learned something. Uh, for additional information or clarification, you can visit our website um, and that link is listed in our chat room. Um, and if you uh, go there, you'll not only get the individual propositions, but you will be able to uh, get links for other uh, sources and uh, resources of information for these propositions. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.